sewing friends and welcome to tonight's so tell me live show with joanne banco and i've got just the greatest guest for you tonight and such a wonderful wonderful topic i know you're gonna love it i'm gonna get you thinking just a little bit about making bags and organizers so i got a question for you how many of you have already done that you can go ahead and and let me know in the chat how many of you would consider yourselves wannabe bag makers? But, you know, I think bagging, bag making and making things for um, organizing, whether it's at home or for travel, uh, making your own travel bags, oh, you're going to see some beautiful things tonight. And I think that is one of the best things you can do to really show off your ability to make it yourself and make it better. Because we all know when we go shopping, we see all of that stuff out there that is inferior or isn't the fabric we like or isn't the color we like. And tonight you're going to see how you can make it yourself. So again, welcome to the Let's Go Sew live show where sewing enthusiasts gather to learn more about their machines and be inspired to sew beautiful, beautiful things. So I'm going to tell you right away who my guest is tonight. Let me bring up a screen here and show you who it is. It is none other than Annie Unrine from buyannie.com. And Annie is a creative lifetime quilter. Uh, she has been designing patterns and teaching since 2000. Her easy to understand patterns include complete instructions to guide makers every step of the way. And really, as you're gonna to see tonight with a focus on practical and very useful projects, Annie's patterns appeal to sewing enthusiasts of all ages and all levels, and really serves as a great base even for classes. So maybe you're a teacher out there, you work at a a sewing shop or you teach uh, sewing classes somewhere, her patterns are wonderful for using in your classes. And again, you're going to see all different levels. Annie is also the creator of Buy Annie's Soft and Stable, which is a product you're going to learn more about tonight that has really rocked the sewing world. It has made such a difference in so many projects for so many people that I know, and I love working with it. It's an innovative product that she designed to add body, stability, and a professional finish to purses, bags, home deck items, and more. So without any further delay, let's welcome Annie. Annie, hello, hello, hello. Hello. Thank you for inviting me to join you tonight. I'm really looking forward to our visit. Oh, it's so great to have you here. And we've got tons and tons and tons of people here already that are just um, telling us where they're from and chatting about you and talking about how much they love your patterns and your website. Believe it or not, I have uh, over a hundred comments here already and just wow, what, that's awesome. what been on just a couple, couple minutes here. So we've got um, Daisy from San Francisco. I'll just shout out to a few people here. Uh, Claudia's from Jefferson, Missouri. Celeste. Hey, Celeste. Celeste is always here, and she is in Illinois, I believe. Uh, Star Raymond from Michigan. Let's see. Uh, Teresa. Teresa's from Northeast Ohio. She's not too far from me. Michelle's here from Pennsylvania. Mary from Arizona. Uh, Clovis from Indiana. So, hey, they're all, they're all here to um, learn more about Annie and buyannie.com and all the beautiful, beautiful things you've designed. Um, Annie, I got to tell you, first off, I have a friend. She's probably here. I haven't um, seen her name pop up yet, but um, very good friend named Jan. And she could probably win the prize for <laughs> making most of your bags. It's every time I see her, she's got a new one and she's actually made me a couple fabulous ones. Oh, I awesome. To show these off. That is probably um, one of my favorites right there. Catch all caddy. Okay. I have one of those on every work table and almost every room of my house. So that is such a handy little bag. It is absolutely wonderful. So that was a gift from her to me. And then this one's going to be a little awkward to show, but I'll show it to you anyway. 
You know, anybody that does live shows knows you have to have a big fat <laughs> microphone. So she made me the a cover or a thing to carry your microphone. How flip nice. it bag. Ah, a flipping out. Bag. Yeah, I love it, that. It I it fits my microphone perfectly. I can tuck it all away when I'm done. Zip it up, and that wonderful um, by Annie soft and stable is in there to protect everything. And I love keep- seeing that. I don't think I have ever thought about putting a microphone in one of those. My favorite thing to put in is a bottle of wine. So okay, <laughs> to each his own, right? <laughs> oh, there's just so much that you can do with your patterns, and I'm I'm just I'm thrilled to have you here with me tonight, and with all of our friends that are here joining us, because I know that some of them, you know, and I could see uh, my friend June is here. She says, love by Annie patterns. Um, but uh, I'm sure we're going to have some people here that have, you know, never tried one of your patterns before, and they are in for a real treat too. So I'll just pop up a few, few comments here. Crafting with Marilyn. She loves to make bags and wants to find time to to make more. Boy, and SK says she's been making tote bags lately, and it's a great way to use leftover denim and upholstery. So she can't wait to hear more. I, you know, I really, I said in the in the beginning when I talked a little bit about uh, your background. You know, for me, and I'm sure for a lot of our friends here, you go shopping, right? And you want, you know, you want something in particular and you never can find it, right? Isn't that one of the big reasons we sew? But when it comes to your bags, number one, you're not going to find bags like this anywhere. I mean, the the bags that you've designed are so, so high end that you really would would require, in my mind, really almost having to have someone custom make it for you if you were looking for a bag like this and you did not know how to make it yourself. Would you agree with that? I would. And and actually, that's the beauty of making it yourself is that you can customize it to suit exactly what you want by picking not only the materials, but customizing the design. If you're left handed and you want your pockets to close that way instead of that way, that's something that you can do. And, you know, if you want to divide a pocket into three sections and have a zipper on each one, you can do that easily, too. So there's yeah, there's lots of things that you can do to make something that perfectly suits you. When I started making bags, I actually was a fan of Vera Bradley bags. Okay. And I had a purse that um, had chickens and eggs on it. And I'm sure they made thousands of that purse. And I loved that purse, but I didn't want a purse that a thousand or 10,000 other people had exactly the same purse. And when it wore out, I thought I can make this. And so one of my very first patterns was kind of based on um, that purse that I liked so well and um, kind of designed from that. Okay. Well, definitely. I think, you know, when I first started seeing your your bags and, um, uh, you know, that the Vera Bradley thing kind of popped into my head. But again, I've seen some of them and not only are they expensive, um, they're, I don't know, they just, they don't seem to have all the, the bells and whistles that you really need in a bag. Yeah. And, and, and the and quality just, on them has definitely changed. It's yeah. not, it's not what they were 20 years ago. No, the definitely. materials are cheaper. They've cut corners. They've had to, I'm sure, to be able to, to make it for the prices that they need to be able to sell it for. Interestingly, we were, I mean, that was kind of what got me into making bags. And we were at a show several years ago and this gentleman came in the booth and he was really studying all of our bags and looking at them and, and things. And, and one of the gals who was working in the booth with me went and talked to him and turned out he was from Vera Bradley and he was scouting out new designs. And when he found out that we sold patterns, not those, he, he very graciously said, Oh, you know, I won't take pictures and do that. But but it was kind of funny that that kind of came full circle. That, that, that is that, you know, that is a great, great compliment (laughs) for sure. But I'm not, I'm not surprised at all. I'm not, not surprised. It is just, it really is just such a joy to be able to um, take a pattern and, you know, find your own fabric. I mean, look at this, you know, I mean, is that just so like, cute. is that way? Oh, sewing machines. Yeah. No. Yeah. And cute. it matches my room. You know, it's in fact, it's funny. The, the other piece that I showed you um, when my friend wanted to, my friend Jan wanted to make 
this for me as a gift. And she said, well, what color would you like? And I said, well, you know what my favorite color is? And she looked at me kind of cross-eyed and I said, yeah, I'd like it in black. It's just like... <laughs> That's my grandson's favorite color too. It drives his mom nuts, but black is nice. <laughs> it just looks nice in, in your room and everything kind of, you know, blends in with it. And so Very that was classic. the closest she came to doing black was to have, you know, black in the background and have some polka dots on it. But yeah. it is so much fun to to be able to customize. So we had so many people here saying saying hello telling you they um, they love your bags, they love your live shows. And yeah, yeah. we'll talk a little bit more about, about the live shows. And absolutely, if you have questions as we're going through, um, I'm, I'm flying solo tonight. So if you could maybe put a cue in front of it um, so that I can kind of catch that a little bit easier, we'll definitely have time to, to answer those questions. But we'll start okay. with my question. My first question is, all right, we, you know, we know a little bit about the why you did this, Annie, but Tell us how, the, the how. How did By Annie actually get started? Uh, it's kind of a long story, and it goes back to kind of where I started. I grew up in a family. My dad was a Lutheran minister. There were five girls in my family. And if you wanted a new dress, you better make it yourself because there was not money to go to the store and, and buy things. So I started out by learning to sew and I sewed my prom dresses. I sewed my wedding dress and all my bridesmaids dresses, um, sewed all kinds of things. And I loved doing crafts and handworks. I love to crochet. I love to embroider. Um, all of those things just really suited me. But when it came time to go to college and, you know, have a career, I never, ever, ever thought that sewing was something that you could make a career from. So, you know, the test that they have you do when you're in, um, in high school of what your career should be showed that I was good at math and numbers and suggested that I be an accountant. So that was the direction I went. So I went to college, um, took the CPA exam, graduated with a degree in accounting, got my CPA certificate right away. And I had gotten married after a couple years in junior college. And my husband, his mom always said he was, uh, he was born a hundred years too late because he really, wanted to live in the middle of nowhere and, you know, just be out away from things and, and live the pioneer life. So we decided that um, we were going to move to Alaska and he got a teaching job. I got a job working as a bookkeeper in this little tiny town. We moved to Alaska. Long story short, we ended up spending over 20 25 years in Alaska. We mm. homesteaded 160 acres. We built a country in, we had a fishing charter business. And basically I spent those 20 years living his dream. I, I had the accounting background, which was very helpful as a business owner when we had our in and things, but I didn't really ever, I worked just a few years as an accountant. So when we sold those businesses and moved to Utah, which is where we live now, my kids were in high school. We got them out of high school and we were kind of, we had sold the other businesses and I was kind of left with now, what am I going to do with my life? So I joined our local quilt guild and that was like the best thing that ever happened to me. I made wow. so many wonderful th friends at the quilt guild. I absolutely loved quilting and everything about it. I, I swear I held every office in the guild that there was because I just, I set my calendar by what was happening in the quilt guild. And, and I loved quilting. I loved making quilts. And one day I decided I really need a way to pay for this quilting habit. I did all the book work. So it's not like my husband ever would have known what I was spending, but in my mind, I wanted it to be my money that I had earned, not mm. family money. Mm -hmm. And so I decided if I started writing patterns, I could probably um, do that. At the time, I was also doing scrapbooking and I was a scrapbooking consultant and I'd have workshops in my house and people who do scrapbooking have all kinds of knickknacks. They have mm -hmm. pens and they have stickers and they have punches Stamps and paper and, and yeah. all of those things. <laughs> and so when I'd have a workshop, I needed some way to display those and make them easy for people to access. So I had made a hanger that's kind of along the lines of this one behind me, but it had okay. more pockets. It was canvas and vinyl, and it had all these pockets to put things in. And one of my customers at the time 
her brother was the publisher of Memory Makers magazine, which was one of the big scrapbooking magazines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she came to the workshop one day and she said, um, you know, we're doing an issue on spring. She helped him with the magazine. She said, we're doing an issue on spring cleaning. And I'm thinking that people would enjoy seeing your organizer because it would be a great way for them to organize their supplies. Would you mind if we took a picture of it? And I said, no, not at all. And I said, but why don't you also add that I have a pattern for it? And she said, okay, how much is it? Well, I didn't have a pattern yet. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Right <laughs> and I said, and, you know, in my mind, patterns were usually $10. So I said $10. And she said, okay, well, if you've ever submitted something to a magazine, you know that you send it in and it's months before anything happens with yeah. it. Yeah. So we did that. She took her picture. She sent it in. And not long after that, my youngest sister's husband found out that he had cancer. Uh -huh. And and he died within just a few months. Mm -hmm. And so I was really busy. She had two young kids. She lived in Colorado. I was busy helping her, you know, get things in order, trying to figure out what, you know, what to do with things. And when, and so I was in Colorado and one day my husband called and he said, I don't know what you've done, but you're getting all these $10 checks in the mail. Oh, and I said, oh, oh yeah, that, that oh. pattern. <laughs> and so fortunately at that time, email existed. And so I was able to e email people and explain to them, you know, what had happened. And they and, were paper, physical paper patterns that you had to send out, right? Right, right. Because that was, that email existed, but PDF patterns and stuff weren't okay, a thing okay. at that point in time. I don't think people would have any clue how to do that. So anyway, I was heading home anyway shortly after that I sat down I wrote the pattern I got it going got those filled and it was such a treat to get a ten dollar check and be able to add a yard of fabric to my stash so I kind of got the bug so not long after that I I started writing additional patterns I took a class at the college to learn how to design a website and write html code so Whoa. I set up my website and I launched um Patterns by Annie was kind of the name, but by Annie.com was what my URL was. I launched that with three patterns. And so, um, yeah, and it kind of grew from there. Wow. So, so, so you're actually, you actually started with three. What were the, the three original and are they still in your lineup? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, hanging organizer was one. It's still in our lineup. Um, I'm pretty sure Annie's favorite purses, which was the one based on the Vera Bradley bag and um, necessaries, which is some little accessories to go in your purse, an eyeglass case, a little pocket wallet, and a little zippered zippered bag. Okay. So those patterns um, are all there. They could greatly stand an update. We have definitely improved um, our everything in 20 years. But uh, yeah, we, we've discontinued a number of patterns. I think I've written over 200 patterns in that 20 year period. And we've discontinued. I used to do a lot of quilts. Heather Purcell, who a lot of people know as Mother Superior, she and I were really close friends and she lived here. And so she would come up with an idea for a quilt and kind of we'd sit down with EQ and design it together. And I'd write the pattern and then she'd make the quilt. She'd pay somebody amazing to quilt it. And then she'd display the pattern in her booth at shows and sell the pattern for me. So that was really a nice thing. But but for me, quilts just weren't my thing. So we've discontinued a lot of the older quilt patterns and, okay. and a few older ones too. But But we continue to come up with new ones regularly. That's really interesting. So do you have a plan for how many you like to... Um, how many new patterns you like to come out with in a year, or do you do it just by, you know, inspiration is striking and you're, you're, you're going to, you know, put that into play or how's that work? You know, when I started, it was a lot of inspiration is striking and I could, I, my goal was always six new patterns for fall and six new patterns for spring market. As we've grown and as things have gotten more complicated and we've gotten more people involved and we've started filming videos and, you know, doing all the marketing and stuff, I, I would say that average is closer to four 
each season now. Okay. Um, but but I always plan to do six because, you know, I'm sure I can. And, you know, it just doesn't always work out that way. But <laughs> but I try to do like a new purse pattern, a new organizer pattern, a new home deck pattern. And then now we're trying to go back and some of the older patterns, we're trying to update a lot of those. Okay. So we try to do at least two new ones and two updated ones each time. Our goal is to eventually have add-on videos for every pattern and the newest layout and design for every pattern. We hired a graphic artist about, gosh, six years ago, I'd guess, who does the illustrations now. And she's just taken our patterns to a whole new level. So wow. that's been really helpful. Do you write all the instructions your, yourself for you? I do. I okay. do. And I know. Then I have my daughter-in-law works really closely with me. So actually the two of the new patterns that we're working on for spring market this year, she came up with the idea of how to do them and she made the prototypes. So we go through a whole long process. Usually we come up with an idea and we make our first prototype just out of soft and stable to get an idea of size and structure mm. and how it's going to work. And, you know, what you can do with soft and stable is very different from what you can do when you add fabric onto it. So then yeah. we make one with fabric and and my son and Glow and I are kind of the pattern development team now. So the three of us pick it apart and, you know, decide everything that needs to change and what needs to be done. And Casey is, he doesn't sew a lot. He can sew, but he is really, really good at thinking outside the box and also challenging us to do something different and make it better and make it more stylish and make it more useful. And so some days it's like, oh, yeah, we had that figured out we thought and, oh, you know, and then he'll come in and it'll be something totally different but but so so we get our prototypes done and sometimes you know we'll make 10 prototypes before we decide okay this this is it we like this this is it and then glow glow will keep notes as she's sewing all those and then she'll give it to me and i'll write the pattern for it but she's she's from spain english isn't her first language mm. So, um, I mean, she's amazing what she can do, but she's very basic, like attach the zipper, you know, which ends up being maybe that much text to tell somebody how to do it. But she just puts the, the general headings in the order that they go in. And then I take it and write that. So after I get the first draft written, I will make one to see if what I think, you know, if I understood what she said, and usually okay. there's a lot of back and forth there about switching things around. And then I give her the pattern to read and we're at that stage now for a new pattern. So then it goes to my tech editor who has this uncanny ability to sew something in her head without ever, you know, taking a stitch. And so her name's Leslie, Lelly Bunny. A lot of people know her as Lelly Bunny on Instagram okay. and stuff. Okay. So she'll she'll pick it apart and give me lots of great suggestions and check all the math and make sure everything works. And then I'll make changes based on that. Then it goes to the graphic designer for her to make illustrations. And then I have then I send it to in-house staff to sew and test. And once we feel like we've got it you know, ready to send out in the world and, you know, everything is working good and everyone can understand it. Then we send it to a whole group of outside testers okay. to get their input on it too. And there have been times when one of those people has said, Ooh, I, I kind of think this needs to be bigger or this needs to be smaller. And, you know, we've gone back to the drawing board and said, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah that it, would it, be better. So, yeah. so it's a long drawn out process, but I think it, it shows in the end result that people have success with what they make. It absolutely does. And I know, you know, I'm, we're, I'm getting some, some comments here. I'll, I'll pop a couple up so that you can see it. Um, the demo videos are wonderful. The add-on videos are awesome. Add-on videos are great to have. So why don't you um, take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about um, what actually makes your patterns different? Because I've, I've had a few comments on, on that too, as far as how the instructions are, are done and, um, and all about the videos and how you decide to, to do those and how those um, combine. I'm going to bring you up full screen for that. Okay. 
So one thing about our patterns is that I approach pattern writing from the perspective of a quilter rather than say a garment sewer. So if you are sewing a jacket or a dress, you're going to buy your pattern, you're going to have all the tissue pieces full size that you lay out on your fabric and cut. Because I approach it from the perspective of a quilter, I design pieces to be cut with rotary cutters and rulers. So very, very seldom do we have actual templates for pieces. I also design it that way so that as you're sewing, you're usually working with a square or a rectangle. So it's easy to mark lines for placing pieces. It's easy to do shaping. And after you get everything attached, then you do some shaping to maybe angle the sides in, round the corners, do things like that. But by cutting with a rotary cutter and ruler, you not only save time, but you get pieces that are much, much more accurate and your pieces are going to fit together much better. It's, it's a little scary to people who haven't done rotary cutter sewing before or cutting before, but it, it really, really makes a difference and saves time once you get used to it. So that's number one, what, what sets them apart. Um, the other thing is I tend to want to tell you everything. So if, for instance, you're making this bag and you want to center these handles on the back, rather than just saying center the handles, we have you mark lines in from each side and there so that you line your handle up right in between them. So there's a lot of measurements, a lot of words, but the one thing that people who make our patterns repeatedly say, just trust Annie. Uh, you know, I do make mistakes and I always am appreciative when somebody writes and says, is this right? Because this doesn't seem right. Because yeah, we've we make mistakes regularly, but but not not as often as we used to because we have so many people involved in it. But I'm gonna tell you everything. So there's a lot of steps. So what what we do is we have a little check mark in front of each step, and I always say, just follow it step by step. Make sure you check off that step and have done everything that it lists before you move on to the next one. At the beginning parts of the pattern, you can kind of skip around. But once you start assembling a project, it's really important that you do things in the right order. And so all of that's included in there. Videos came about largely after I started teaching Craftsy classes. So um, I taught five different classes on Craftsy. and that they changed, they changed our business a lot because people who had looked at our patterns and say, oh, those look too hard, now could see the step-by-step -step and understand that everything was very doable. They weren't that hard. And so our business really grew after that. And then we got requests, you know, for classes for that. Well, when I taught a craftsy class, I would usually make five, um, I would cut five sets of whatever it was I was making so that I would have step outs to show for all the steps. And we would spend two or three days filming and, and you know, a month or two before that preparing scripts and, you know, getting everything organized. And then they would do all the editing. And we're just a really small team. And we knew that there was no way we could do a full craftsy class for everything. So what we did is we wrote four basic patterns um, and that that's one thing i want to talk about but they four basic patterns that kind of teach you all of our basic skills and for those patterns we filmed very in-depth step-by-step tutorials that show you how to cut and rotary cut and how to quilt and how to make your own bias binding and how to attach binding. And with those four videos, we always recommend they're free patterns on our website. The videos are all free. We recommend that people start with those so that they learn the basic techniques that apply across the board to a lot of our patterns. We've actually added a few more patterns to that lineup too. Once they've made that, we don't have to cover all those things in the videos. So we decided, We'll just do videos that cover the more unique or the more challenging parts of the pattern. And that way we can actually hopefully get it done. It's still a huge process. Like we will film a video. Um, I'll spend maybe three days writing scripts. We'll take an afternoon and Jake, who's our videographer, Glow and Casey and I will sit down and read through the script and hash it out. I tend to say more than I need to a lot of times. So they've done a really good job of getting me um, 
to be more concise. Uh, so we'll get the script all figured out and then we'll spend a day or two filming and then it's Jake's job to get it edited. And, you know, that can take sometimes a month depending on how much B-roll he, he has to put in. We try to, instead of having you just sit there and watch me at the sewing machine sewing, we try to make it really educational and also have pictures that show things up close and how it's used so that, um, so I think they're really professionally done, but because of that, they they aren't step by step through the whole thing. Yeah. So because we wanted those to be accessible to people in our and we only sell patterns primarily as printed patterns because we really want to support local quilt shops. We include a coupon in the paper patterns that enable people to get the videos for free when they buy the pattern. So um, so they don't pay anything extra for it. And it's just a really great resource for people. Okay. we I got to pull up a few of the comments that we're getting here. Um, Blue Hen says she loves the community that you've created and your patterns are doable even for the novice. I think that's really important because when I said, you know, at the very beginning in the introduction that, you, you know, they really do appeal to all levels. Now I could see that that beautiful bag you have to your to your left, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah, to the big, the great big one there with this the way. handles on it. Um, that might not be the the one with the pink in the center or purplish, right, close to you, or it looks close to you. This one, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's this is actually not going to be your. Well, maybe not. Uh, that one. This looks is easy. actually a really easy purse, yeah. and I have step outs because I thought maybe I'd show you how easy this is to make. Okay, well, we let's hang on to that thought for a minute. Do you, so. Along that line, are 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 the patterns um, labeled at all for levels or? Um... You know, we have been asked, you know, why don't you put that on there? And the thing that I learned is one of our bigger bags is called Ultimate Travel Bag. And it makes, you know, a bag that's like this size. I've seen that, that one. My friend Jan made, of, made that more than one. One of our best-selling bags. And it was one of my Craftsy classes. And I had people in that Craftsy class who not only had never made a bag before, but who had never sewn before. Wow. And they very successfully made that bag. So to say, you know, that you have to be an advanced or an intermediate sewer to be able to make that, I just couldn't bring myself to do that. Well, this year, we finally, we made a little booklet that you can find on our website. It's called project of the month ideas and we made it for stores to give them some ideas for classes. And we did go through and classify levels of sewing like easy, easy, easiest, intermediate, advanced, or I can't even remember now what the levels were. Because I didn't want to say you have to be an experienced sewer to do this. It's like, and what we classified was, you know, how many zippers does it have? How many pieces does it have? How many, how much bulk is there? Those are the things that make it a little bit harder. But in terms of doing it, you know, it's really very doable by anybody. Yeah, hard and doable are two opposite ends of, of the spectrum. But, um, you know, when you have good instructions and, and video, obviously, in combination with good written instructions and a well-designed pattern, you're, you already have the path to success. So if you just take it one step at a time and you know how to run your sewing machine, I, I really think, um, you, I, I, you know, I agree 100 percent there. There really, it really makes makes everything doable. Um, yes. My friend Jan, who I've been talking about, says your pattern instructions are wonderful. And the video with the video add on that really just, you know, kind of seals it, and makes it really, really perfect. That's um, nice. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> She's one of your biggest fans for sure. Her and my, uh, my friend uh, Christy, they're they're both good friends too. And a lot of times they make the same bags, uh, maybe a little different fabric, you know, but they they work on things together and uh, they're always showing showing um, showing me what they what they've done. It's always really, really great. That's um, awesome. Uh, Julianne says she has some soft and stable coming, so she's going to get ready to um, try your patterns. Um, let's see what Teresa said. Attaching binding can be imitate in intimidating for some. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to probably talk about some tips on, on that tonight. We um, certainly can. Celeste says um, you are always so helpful. And then my friend Dawn from Creative Appliques um, and by the way, Dawn is going to be my guest next month. So 
stay tuned for that. Um, but Dawn says she started with your free patterns and designs and <laughs> you got her hooked. But, you know, that's another really wonderful thing that you do offer. And that is um, projects that somebody can try out, see, you know, how to use everything, how to use the zippers, um, all of those special notions that you have and not, you know, not have to make an investment in a pattern until they give it a little bit of a spin and then see what they want to do, what they want to do next. So, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, I know another thing, actually, um, Ann says here, uh, I want to get your catalog. I have the catalog and I, I have to tell you, I, I used to collect every catalog and never could throw them away. Like, you know, the keepsake quilting, the, the you know, the Nancy's notions, all of those would come in the mail. And I just, I couldn't bear to part with any of them because they were so inspiring. So uh, over the years, I've started to pare them down. But when I got your catalog in the mail, I said, this is a keeper. This one is not going anywhere. So um, that's great. Well, we try to put a lot of helpful information. There's always a zipper color card. There's the colors of the mesh and the fold over. We usually put a free pattern or some tips of something in it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really helpful information in that catalog. And for people who I think we probably have our most recent catalog available still. Um, you can go on our website and type in catalog, and I think you can order it for. I think you can. I think I saw it just the other day when I was uh, uh, browsing on, on your. And if it's not there, and for ones that aren't available, the older ones, they're all on there as PDFs. And so you're welcome to page through them as a PDF or print them out yourself if you'd like. But yeah, those are really helpful. Yeah, and we've actually got a, a, a couple um, a couple comments on paper patterns, and it's it's interesting because um, you know another whole topic. But I've had some some questions recently about in the garment making space about a new program that's come out, and you know you I know it's already been out where people are projecting patterns and all that. But I'd like to hear you know in the comments, um, you know, just tell me uh, yes, I'm a paper person if you are, but for me. I find it a little bit hard to convert over to that. I like having, I like having a package and I like opening it up and reading the instructions and sitting in a soft chair with it and getting off the screen and cutting the paper apart and, and checking all that. the boxes as you go, having something that you can do that on. The other thing that I have found with a lot of the PDF patterns that you download is you've got 60 or 70 pages while you're done. And, yeah. and it's like a book trying to print it out. And I have a hard time just following. I want it to, I want to have it at my cutting table. I want to, you know, take it to the sewing machine, take it back and forth. And to me, it's just yeah. easier. A lot of the reason too, that we sell paper patterns is we really, really believe strongly in supporting local quilt shops that we have to all do what we can to keep them strong Absolutely. and vibrant. And I've had more than one store, sto store owner who has said, thank you for carrying paper patterns because that brings people into the store. They can't get it online. And so, and our distributor customers who are a huge part of our business have said, you know, we won't carry it the same way if it's a PDF pattern as if it's a paper pattern. So checker distributors, who is one of our uh, biggest customers, mm -hmm. if you go look on their website and you click on the patterns tab and you click by top selling, it's not at all unusual to see half of the top 20 patterns all be by any patterns. Be and I know that that helps, you know. And yeah. what we look at is that stores are out there interacting with people on a day-to-day -day basis. They're teaching classes. They're kind of our boots on the ground. We're such a small company. There's no way that we could support, you know, all of those people with classes and, and things without local quilt shops. So they're really, really important to us. Well, and back to the whole topic of PDF, I'm not, you know, I, I, I like being able to download it because there's sometimes when you, you need something like today because you right. want to make it tomorrow. Right. So it's nice to have that, that option and opportunity. But even it, when you're downloading a PDF pattern and you're downloading the instructions, you're printing it on paper. So essentially, you know, you're just getting the, the immediate fix. And then I'm, I'm with you, Annie. I'll stand on my soapbox for, you know, days at a time um, telling people support your local shop. 
over and over and over again. Um, but we do have to realize, okay, when you lived in Alaska, I bet that was a little tricky because there probably weren't as many as you'd you'd like. Well, to you support. know, I lived and, in Alaska back in the 1980s, so there wasn't even the internet then. Yeah. So yeah, but people you know, do, you know, do have um, sometimes, you know, to to go to other sources in order to be able to get to get what they need. But we're getting a lot of people that said they like they like paper patterns for okay. sure. I and, definitely know that people who live in foreign countries would definitely appreciate having the PDF option. But, you know, we're trying to get stores around the country or around the world carrying our patterns so that you may not be able to, you may not have a store right where you live, but hopefully there's a store in your country who has it and, you know, you're helping support them and keep them, keep them going. Right. Absolutely. And uh, Vicki's got, I posted her, her comment here. She's one of, one of her favorite Local quilt shops carries the patterns and has classes for the the biani pattern. So I would actually encourage anybody out there, you know, quilt shop owners, um, sewing machine dealerships. I've uh, been involved with them for many many years. They are they are busy people. Like every minute of every day that they're in the shop, they are you know they are occupied with something. So they may not even be aware of your patterns or the demand for it. So make sure that you mention it to them and then they can contact um, Annie and order wholesale or order through um, some of your, your wholesale suppliers and um, get, get started in your own, in your own shop. And, you know, I would also encourage some of you out there, if you love by any patterns and you're using them and you've, you know, you've become, uh, you know, experienced with them, Think about offering to teach a class in your local shop, because that's another area. I know you you would agree with me. I could see you shaking your head. So I want to hear your comment in a minute. But again, shops sometimes they don't carry some products for a big reason because they need somebody to demonstrate it and show it in order to sell it. Because we all know sewing is all about doing. So there's another idea for some of you out there, too. And uh, there may be some budding teachers out there that you haven't thought about teaching before and this might get you get you into it so that is absolutely so true and i can tell you we've been doing live with annie episodes for two and a quarter years now not quite a quarter but um and so we mention local quilt shops every week and you know ask for this first at your local quilt shop before you come to our website and i can't tell you how many times people have said i took in the bags i made you know i showed them this and now they're carrying it and yep. just a couple of weeks ago we used to always do a show um in puyallup washington which you've probably done the sew expo great show we loved yep. being there loved doing it but we are so short staffed and just so many things going on that we just decided we can't do that this year. But I contacted several stores that were going to be there and there's like six or seven vendors who um, are going to carry our stuff. And I sent them models that they could display in their um, store. And one store who said, actually, I hadn't even contacted her because I didn't recognize her store name, but she said one of her customers who had watched live with Annie went in and said, Annie's not going to be at Sew Expo. You should consider taking some of her stuff to the show. She ended up with three huge boxes of models. We shipped her two pallets. She brought in every color of zippers. She brought in, you know, basically every product we had, mm -hmm. all the colors, all the styles. And that wouldn't have happened if that customer wouldn't have asked for yeah. it. So um, it makes a huge difference. I got to bring up Anne's comment here. She said quilt guilds could do classes. And I know you sell some things even in, um, you know, in, a, in a, like a group, a group order. But, you know, there you have so many different notions and things to, to, to talk about. I think probably the best way is for you to go ahead and, um, you know, demonstrate whatever it was you you had the idea to to show me. OK, you ready for well, that? I have. Two things that I for sure want to do. I want to tell you about the Biani basics and some of the things that you're going to learn doing those. And then I want to tell you about this bag. So um, our Biani basics patterns are simple one page front and back patterns. So one sheet patterns. They're free to download at our website. So you just go to Biani.com 
and then click on the patterns tab and you'll see a little drop down menu that says buy any basics. Uh, there are more than just these four patterns here, but these are kind of the core. The first one that we recommend that people make is our pattern called Petty Four Baskets. And as you're making this project, you're using Soft and Stable. And let me grab a piece of Soft and Stable so I can tell you about it. So Soft and Stable is something that I developed to give body and stability to the projects. So it's a firm but resilient foam. It has a soft fabric lining on each side. It's a sew-in stabilizer. It doesn't have any fusibles on it to gum up your needle or, you know, stick to things. And it just, it turns your bag or your project from something that looks homemade to something that looks like you bought it and is available in black or in white. We use white probably 99% of the time, but if you're doing dark fabrics, the black really enhances those and it's nice to use for that too. The thing to know about soft and stable is if you want it to fold somewhere, you stitch a line through it and it's going to fold really crisply along that line. If you have bulk in the seam allowance, you stitch additional lines in the seam allowance and that helps to compress those. So as you make this little project, you're stitching some lines along the sides and along the bottom and you're learning how the soft and stable folds and holds its shape in that structure based on how you sewed it and things. So super simple, little easy um, project to make. You can use it to put your spools of thread in. It's great for holding fat quarters. There's so many ways to use Petty Four Baskets. So that's the first project. The second one that we have you move on next is Peacekeeper. And this is just a little zippered project bag um, that's great for carrying whatever you want in it. In this project, you learn about quilting with soft and stable. So you're going to layer your main and lining fabric with a piece of soft and stable, stitch through it however you want. We just did straight lines up and down, had you mark the lines with those. You learn how to make an, a simple interfaced handle. You learn how to attach a zipper to a mesh pocket, how to make a border and attach that, and then how to make your own bias binding and attach that, but you're doing it on a flat project that's not dimensional. So super simple and easy. One of the tools that I highly recommend is our stiletto. This is a tool that we developed um, many years ago and uh, we spent many years developing it. We have some videos on the website that so show some of the iterations we went through uh, trying to come up with the design, but this, in my mind is almost as important as a rotary cutter and ruler. So right up there with that. But this makes doing bindings so much easier because you can grab your fabric and pull it into place. You can hold it there all, you know, until your needle gets there almost where you can't keep your finger, finger there that long. And it just makes a huge difference. So in the video for that, we show how you how to attach the binding and we share some tips for how, you know, what to do with um, as you're going around corners, if you get wrinkles, you know, tips and, and tricks for that. One really important tip that I can share, and I learned this in the very first um, class that I ever taught, which was for Annie's favorite purses. And there was a lady in the class and, and I had found that I was having trouble with my binding wrinkling as I turned it over and was trying to stitch along the side. And she said, well, how did you prepare your binding? Did you press it? And I said, oh yeah, I pressed it. I, you know, cause that's what I'd been taught. You fold your binding in half, you press it, and then you sew it on. And she said, well, that's your problem. If you would pin your, fold your binding in half, match your raw edges and put pins every two to three inches and skip the pressing, you will find that you eliminate those creases and wrinkles. Huh. And I have never pressed a binding again since wow. then. It really makes a huge difference. And if you think about it, if you fold a binding in half and press it, and then you go, so you've got a double layer and you go to sew it along, you know how one layer moves a little bit quicker than the other and mm -hmm. not exactly mm -hmm. consistently. If those layers aren't moving the same, when you go to fold it over, you've got that sharp crease pressed in there and it's gonna be a lot harder to get rid of wrinkles. So try it and see what you think. But to okay. me, that makes a huge difference. Just a couple couple questions for you. So, do you recommend cutting the bias, or well, I already I already let that word out. Do you recommend cutting the binding on the bias, or do you 
um, have it on the straight grain or does it depend on the It on the depends project? on the project. If we're binding just a straight piece across, we always do it with straight grain binding. If it has to go around any corners or curves, then we cut it on the bias. And I have a super easy way of making bias binding. That is what we use in basically all of our patterns. We, we try, my mom was a child of the depression and I learned to be very, very frugal. And so we try really hard when we design our patterns to make best use of the fabric and you know to not waste a lot. So we found that the best way to make sure that people get the right amount of binding for their project, they don't have a ton left over and, and that it's easy for them cut, to cut is we always start with a square. So, so for instance, if you want it to make a piece of bias and I love making binding that's bias on the diagonal or with stripes because you get that kind of candy cane look as you go around mm. but you start by cutting a square and then you cut that square in half from corner to corner diagonally so um, all of our patterns tell you how to make your own bias binding so you're not going to the store and trying to buy binding that's not the right width not the right fabric, not the right color. We make the binding out of the same fabric as we make the, the project. So you're going to take that square and you're going to cut it in half diagonally. So cut it from corner to corner. And then you end up with two rectangles or two triangles. So you've got one that looks like this and one that looks like this. Now your secret is to join those together. And this was hard for me to figure out when I first started, but I finally, figured out how to describe it in a way that made sense to me and it seems to work well for other people. So I'm going to take one of them and I'm going to position it on my table so it looks like a mountain. So there's a peak at the top and, and this is at the bottom. And I call this one a valley. So on this one, I put the peak at the bottom and I set that right next to it. And then if I turned them this way, and joined my seam, it'd be really easy to match this seam on this striped piece. But I wanna make sure that when I join the other end, they match too. So I always do the hard part first. So I put these two together, I line my stripes up, I fold my valley over onto my mountain or my mountain onto my valley, it doesn't matter which order you do it in. I line those up and I'll sew that to make a parallelogram and I'll make sure that my stripes match all the way across. So if you look at this, there's a seam that goes right here, but you don't notice it because my stripes are matching all the way across. Then you're going to take that and cut your strips from it. And the secret on that is make sure you're cutting on the bias edge, not not this way. I've seen too many people go and cut mm. their pieces out like this. And then all they have is straight grain binding with a ton of seams in it. So you want to turn it like this. And then what I usually do, because my rulers aren't long enough, even on a square this size to go from side to side, I just bring this side over and fold it over and line it up at the bottom. And it's going right along that center seam. I fold this one over and do it. And then I can line my ruler up on here and cut my strips out. Okay, we gotta, just, let me so, let me interject a quick question. Uh, Mary wanted to know what size square you started with. It depends on the project how much you need to end up with. Okay, so, so is that something that's actually in the pattern? Yes. Oh yes. wow, that's that really makes it easy. The pattern will tell you exactly what size so that you're sure to have enough, and it will tell you what size to cut it. Um, and our newer patterns, for probably at least the past two years, will also say cut this size square to make this many inches of bias binding. So if you have bias binding left from a quilt that you made, you know, and you want to know if you have enough and don't have to cut that square, then you can do it. Okay. So you'll cut all those strips out. And then again, you, then you can take those edges and match your seams there and join it. So when you go to sew this binding on, all of your stripes are matched perfectly and people absolutely can't tell where you started and where you ended, but super easy to do. And the pattern for peacekeeper i believe goes through all of the demo on that okay so it'll be there if not we have a another video if you go to our website there's a tutorials tab yeah and Janet. right down from that there's one called bindings and it 
has all of that information in there too. And so Janice is commenting on that just right now. She says she watched uh, Annie's video on the website demonstrating this truly amazing and it worked. Yeah. And <laughs> Lisa, does. Lisa says super binding tips. Seems she's made hundreds of yards the hard way. The life's going to be easier now. And then we had a really good question here. I want to bring this one up um, real quick before I lose it because they're pouring in. <laughs> All the comments and questions are pouring in here, Annie. Um, Shirley says, is it hard? It's hard. She says, it's hard being a lefty. How do you put binding on being left handed? You Annie? know, I'm not left handed, but Gloria is. And Gloria and my tech editor, Leslie, is left handed. And okay. Brooke, who used to work for us, was left handed. And Jackie, who works for us, and Peyton are both left handed. So we do sewing classes for our staff every week. And basically what most all of them have said is you just have to learn to do it with both hands. And they use the stiletto, you know, back and forth between the hands, but I do yeah. too. Sometimes I'm using the stiletto in this hand to do it. So you just kind of have to get in the habit of maneuvering the, maneuvering your hand but the stiletto i think makes a huge difference it's not it's not the same as having your hand there so i think people people manage that i said one of these days we need to do a live and have all those people have us film them and show some of the things that they do but i know glow in particular says she uses it in her right hand a lot okay. of times yeah well we all know you know sewing machines are not designed for left-handers at all. I mean, everything is, everything on the screen is there on the, on the right yeah. and the ones that have screens. So uh, mm -hmm. I feel, I, I do feel for the lefties. They have had to learn to live in a right-handed world for sure. Oh, yeah. uh, I didn't know, Don, I didn't know you were a lefty. Um, and, and Don is uh, from Creative Apple Case is saying, yes, the, the stiletto helps a lot too. Um, I want to back up just on the stiletto. Just, I, I had a couple questions um, uh, that came in on that. And one of them were like, what, was it like the length and the ergonomics? I mean, what made it so um, take you the, the trial and error in order to um, A lot of it that? was the ergonomics, trying mm -hmm. to get it to fit your hand. It's super light. And I've tried metal stilettos and different ones that your hand gets so tired. So there's several things. First of all, the ergonomics, we, we turned it and you'll see that was what changed a lot made it narrower. It's small enough, but you put this in your hand and you just don't even know you're holding it. It's so lightweight. We also added a, an angled end. So you have a little press seam presser. So if for instance, you're doing your binding and you've joined the ends and you have just that one seam to press, you don't want to go to the ironing board just to press that. So you can take that and rub it along your seam and press your seam. But what real, oh, and then we flattened the sides. So when you drop it on your table, it stays there and you're not crawling on, around under the table looking for it. But the best thing on it is we send these tips to a needle making factory and they sand grind them. So they're just a little bit rough and it's hard to imagine what a difference that makes. But when you go to do it, have you ever used a stiletto and your hand is constantly doing this as you're working because it's sliding off mm -hmm. because it doesn't have that? This mm -hmm. grabs your fabric and just pulls it into position. Let's see if I've got something here. So this is our peacekeeper bag ready to be bound. So you, I've got that sewn on and you can... I don't know if you can see this, but see how I can just grab that and lift it and I can position it right where I want it, start stitching, and then I move down about an inch and I say, okay, I want this folded edge to be just past that line of stitching so that when I stitch along here, my binding stitch is falling out in the same place on the other side. Because mm -hmm. my goal when I'm done is you can't tell which side I stitched from. It looks the same on both sides. So on this side, it's close to that folded edge. And on this side, it's in the same place, close to that folded edge. Perfect. So it takes a little bit of practice. I've gotten better as I've gone. But, but the really important thing on binding is make sure that you're sewing with an accurate seam. Because we cut our binding two and a quarter inches so that if you sew with a nice accurate quarter inch seam and bring that around and accommodate for that little bit of bulk because of all your layers, when you bring that around, 
that folded edge should be just past that so that you're stitching in the same place from each side. If you fold it around, and, and I usually do a little check before I start sewing, and it goes way further than that, that means your stitch wasn't wide enough. So you need to go back and refine your seam by making it a little bit bigger. If, if there's just no way that you can get it to cover that line, and usually where I run into a little bit of problems on that is corners because I sometimes get a little bit bigger. But if you look at this, you can see how I can grab this. I could pull that binding all the way over there if I wanted to. But I can usually um, solve any problems of a too tight binding just by using the stiletto to pull it into position. If not, you can clip a little bit of the excess fabric so that it's right. I like a really full fully filled binding. It's kind of like what I learned making quilts. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were going to enter a quilt in a contest, that was one of the main things that judges looked at is, is your binding fully filled? So we really work with that too, to make sure that, um, that the binding is filled and, and um, not loose. The other thing, when I said you want to make sure it doesn't go too far if, if your binding, if your seam wasn't big enough and you fold that binding over and you say, okay, well, it needs to end up there, but you've got loose binding up here, out here, that's when you're going to get wrinkles. You're going to see wrinkles out there because it's not fully filled. And you're also going to find that it wears more there because it's loose and it's going to, it's going to wear out a lot quicker. And do so. you actually recommend, do you recommend um, sewing the binding with a walking foot? I know Anne um, Philbeck uh, popped a uh, comment up earlier and that's uh, I actually that's what she does yeah you don't the only thing I use my walking foot for is the actual quilting okay and part okay. of the reason for that is the walking foot on my machine is so wide and it has such a wide opening in the center that I want to the accurate quarter inch seam is the most important thing to me. And I want to see where my needle is and I, and I want it to control it. So I use my quarter inch foot. I sew on a Bernina and I use the number 37 foot 99% of the yeah. time. Occasionally oh. I'll switch like to an edge stitch foot if I'm doing an eighth of an inch from the edge because it's closed in the front and it holds the fabric down easier. But um, the walking foot on my machine just doesn't give me the control that I want. So yeah. I don't use that. A lot much. of it, there, there are so many, I'm a brother ambassador. So I, I work with brother machines, but there are so many, so many varieties. I actually love using the walking foot for binding personally, but what I do is I set the, the foot. So it's fully touching the fabric, but then I move my needle position over yeah. so that I can get it to stitch right where, where, where I like where it. I, it. That works for me. Um, another thing, another little trick that I do, and I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts on this, is sometimes I will use a zigzag stitch or a decorative stitch to sew the binding because that way I've got the ultimate forgiveness factor and it doesn't matter, you know, exactly where that Absolutely. stitch is going. It's and that, that's certainly an option, especially on something like this, you know, where your binding is a decorative part and you've got this nice flat piece where you might run into trouble. Actually, let me talk quickly about this one. So this is the next project in the Biani Basics that we recommend. This is just a little bag that has a mesh pocket on the back so you can carry your phone. There's a pocket for your credit card, a place to put your ID in. So if you're going to a quilt show, this is really nice. Sometimes people will put a fabric pocket up here because they don't need the see-through ability of it. But we developed this one to give you more practice quilting, but also how to work with mesh, how to work with fold over elastic, how to work with vinyl, how to attach a zipper in a quilted fabric. And then on this one, you make the binding and it becomes your handle too. But again, everything's flat and straight and easy to do. And then the last project um, in that series is called um, Easy Does It. So this is one where, you know, doing a decorative stitch or a zigzag could be problematic because on here your bindings on the outside or in the inside and if it doesn't if it goes into the bag that's going to be more obvious uh, once you assemble your bag but yeah this i'm project, thinking more almost like as a decorative effect on the binding that's on the on the outside or even i do it on straps and different things like that too just to kind of mix things up a little bit but um yeah it's uh there are just so many so many different things. Um, yeah. Martha has a quick question here. Um, does Annie use the 37 foot with 5.5 or nine millimeter? Can you clarify on that? 
So the machine that I sew on most of the time is an older machine. It's a five series. So it's a five millimeter machine. I do have a 790 plus that's a nine millimeter machine. And part of the reason I don't use that machine very much is because, um, because of that foot. It, the foot is bigger on that machine because it's got a wider part to cover and it kind of gets in my way. I'm such a creature of habit and I'm so used to that other foot. I can go where I want and know that things are going to fit. But I have heard that you can actually use the 37 on the bigger machine. So that might be an option too. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because again, you know, back to the whole idea of, of, you know, staying close with your, with your local dealer. Uh, you, you need those, those introductory classes to learn what your machine can do, because even if you don't know how you're going to utilize that that particular feature down the road, you're going to be making something. You're maybe making one of Annie's bags, and you go, "Oh, I can move my needle over. Oh, I could I could set the zigzag to a different width. Oh, I have this stitch here that I can do that." And that really it really does enhance your whole sewing world for sure. Um, yep, and I always tell people if you're looking to buy a new machine take one of our projects in and see how it handles sewing through multiple layers. See how the feet work, you know, on quarter inch seams going around a dimensional project. Cause so this is the last project that we recommend. And on this one, people learn how to put a zipper between two strips, how this is one of the most important things of this pattern. And that's how to do a, a binding that lays flat and doesn't have bulk so you can join your sides and then how to put um, binding on a dimensional project so yeah if you took something like this in to see you know how does what does it do when it tries to sew through two layers or four layers of soft yeah. and stable and 10 layers of fabric so that's well that's easy and i i popped up a, a question here from daisy may she says she has most of your patterns well, not a really question, a statement, but she's petrified of making the zipper. So, and I've already had a few people say, can you have Annie back? So we will definitely, we're just about, just about out of time, time here tonight, but we'll definitely do that again. And we'll, maybe we can do like a real focus on a couple um, special notions like the zippers, because I know I would you've, love done, to do that. you've done videos, but it's great to have, you know, different people asking different questions with a little bit of different perspective and and sometimes, you know, kind of kind of co-hosting like this. But I'm just scrolling through some of the, the questions to make, you know, questions and comments to make sure that I got most of them up here. While um, you do that, I'm going to grab out the step outs for this bag because I don't want to miss showing you Okay, you, you go ahead and do that. I'll, I will go ahead and I will just put myself up here for just a minute. And really, we're just we're just having so many good good comments here tonight and so many interesting things. So I will take just a minute to let me get this comment off the screen and I will take just a minute to um, thank everybody for watching, being here live. Um, you've already seen we have we have so much fun in the chat that sometimes it's, it's hard to stop. We have trouble stopping ourselves, um, but it's great to see everybody and, and have all the all the fun, um, you know, camaraderie that we have here. But um, I do appreciate everybody also that is watching on the replay. So I know some of you have to scoot out a little bit early and you'll come back and catch the rest of the show on, on the replay as well. But um, lots of good information. And this information stays up on the, my YouTube channel and stays up on my um, Facebook page as well. So be sure to hit like, subscribe, hit the bell. You know the drill. Um, that way you always know when there's a new show coming up. And I do this show the uh, fourth Monday, with, with rare exception, fourth Monday of every month at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I always have somebody special here um, that uh, we can all learn from and uh, chat so, chat about sewing, our favorite, favorite subject. So, Annie, are you ready? I am ready. All right, I'll bring you back here. So this is a pattern that's one of my older patterns. And this is called On the Town. And the reason I wanted to show you this today is that it's a really good example of the benefit of using soft and stable. So I don't know if you can tell from there, but this bag is made with soft and stable. This bag I made with quilt batting. If you could see these up close, you would notice that the one that's made with quilt batting is doesn't have the same structure and it's kind of wrinkly. 
where you're especially going to notice the difference is I put these wooden handles on here. And when I let go of the handles on the one made with batting, my whole bag collapses. It doesn't have the structure to stand up to the weight of those handles. This bag that I made was soft and stable. I can let go of the handles and it still stands up and holds its shape. So when you're ready to put something in your purse, you know, you can open it and put your things in and it's not going to fall over and be flimsy. So this pattern was written back in my Texture Magic days. Texture Magic is a polyester fabric that shrinks. And so if you want to create texture on something, you sew it to a piece of fabric and steam it and it gives you this great texture. So this pattern was written kind of to showcase that. That stuff, basically, was, that stuff was all the rage for a while there. Oh, it was. It, <laughs> it definitely was. It It's what turned my business from a hobby into a business because all the distributors picked up my patterns based on that. But I, I want to pop up this question real quick while you're showing that. Um, Cindy had asked uh, previously, what types of fabrics are your bags made from? So while you're showing that, why don't you tell us a little bit about the fabrics too? Okay, Cotton quilting fabrics are what we use the vast majority of the time. Soft and stable turns any fabric into something sturdy enough to use in a purse or bag. So basically everything that you see here is made out of just cotton quilting fabrics. So on this pattern, you cut the center out of your textured fabric. You center it on a piece of soft and stable, stitch around it. We put these little folded flanges in, and then you've got pieces that you've cut for the size. This is one of my patterns that does have templates because I couldn't figure out how to, you know, cut this out using rulers, but you line that up on the edge you sew down that with your quarter inch seam, you fold it out and there's the front of your bag ready to go. So here's the back of your bag, even easier. It's just one piece of fabric. So you make the front, you make the back, attach those to soft and stable. Then you take those two pieces together, put them together with your right sides together. You sew a half inch seam on each side, press those seams open. Sew your bottom seam with a half inch seam, bring your sides together boxed bottom, stitch across that. And basically you can see there's your bag ready to go. I'm gonna turn it right side out um, so you can see that. Then you do the very same process to make your lining, leaving a little opening in the bottom of your lining. We also add some pockets to the lining. Um, put those together with the right sides together. Sew around the top, but, but you can see there's your, there's your super easy, simple bag to make. And, um, then attach your handles. If you're doing wooden handles like this, you just make these little tabs that you sew on the side to hold the handles. You make a little flap. There's a magnet underneath here to close the top. The pattern also includes instructions for fabric handles, um, if you'd rather have fabric handles, but just super easy to do. Muted, sorry. Oh. That's I right. muted myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I just said it's beautiful, as is everything else that that is um, surrounding you there. Thank you. Yeah. So we've we've taken care of that that muting issue, but I really I'm just um, trying again to to make sure I've got all the comments here, then mm -hmm. questions um, answered. So let's see here. Um, like I said, they were flying in so fast. So. Um, Ed asked, what was the name of that pattern? On the Town Roman numeral two. So it's been updated from the original two, but when it has a Roman numeral rather than like a 2.0, if it's a 2.0, you know it has an add on video to go with it. If it has okay. a Roman numeral two, we haven't done that yet. But and then, um, um, we did get a question about your YouTube channel. So I've got that um, scrolling across. But um, Celeste has a question. I'm sure, um, have Annie, have you seen those bags that are made with the the, the candy bags? Yep. Um, do you have a, a pattern that you maybe would recommend in your lineup that would work well for that? I think Easy Does It would be good. We also have a pattern called Diddy ba Bags that's one of our older patterns, this is a fun one. This is called Open Wide, and it includes three sizes. I could see the candy bags working really well for this. So this is one piece of fabric that folds around to make the front, the bottom, the back, and then you sew ends on. It has a fun, easy to install zipper, and 
you can open it up. It's got mesh pockets on the inside okay. and three different sizes. So I could see that one being a really fun one. Maybe yeah, handy bags. definitely. Um, Marsha asks, um, are the inside seams bound or is there a lining? I think I on think this kind of bag, there is a lining that covers okay. the seams. On most of our bags, I don't like loose linings. I just don't like that baggy look and trying to make them. So the vast majority of our patterns are designed where you quilt your main and your lining fabric to your soft and stable, and then you cover the seams with binding. Our patterns are really known for having a really professional finish, so you don't have exposed seams, and the bindings are key to that. The Definitely. bindings also give your project great stability. If you look at this little bag, this is my catch-all caddy, kind of like yours, which is totally full with all kinds of stuff. But you can <laughs> see how it stands up and holds its shape, and the binding is a really important part of causing that. I often have people um, look at that bag and say, what kind of cording did you use in these outside seams? There is no cording. It's just binding over two or three layers of soft yeah, and stable that yeah. gives that structure. And then Jan wanted to know when um, when the new patterns will, will be coming out. We are doing the H&H &H Americas show in um, Chicago in June, which is a show for store owners. Our goal is to have them ready for that. Okay. And um, June just said she's, she's loving everything here. Vicki, um, uh, pop that one off. I meant to pop it back up. Is there a zipper option for the bag? For the on the town? No. Okay. Um, you do have um, magnetic snaps though, don't you? We do. So there's a magnetic snap underneath the flap. We do have a pattern called Totally Trendy Totes, another one called Bon Voyage. That's kind of a similar size and style. And those do have the instructions for a recessed zipper in those patterns. So, I mean, you could either make that bag if you like this style, you could take that that design and translate it to here. You might have to change the measurements a little bit to get it to fit, but it'd be easy to add a zipper in the yeah. top of that. That makes perfect, perfect sense. Um, let's see. I want to, I want to make sure that, okay. Um, can, uh, ooh, some, I'm telling you, there's just so many comments here tonight. It's hard to get, it's hard to keep control over them, but um, Kim wanted to know about a link to your website. So I put that up and I also put your uh, YouTube channel up there and I will be adding all of Annie's contact information to the show notes um, after the show um, uploads. So yeah. Love. Can I make one little quick plug for our local quilt shop sure, contest? Sure, please too? do, Annie. Please so do. So during the month of February, we hold a contest. This is our sixth year doing it for local quilt shops around the world. Um, we ask people to vote for their favorite shops, say what they love about them, and then we've got great prizes. This year we have grand prizes that we'll award to a winner in the US, Canada, Australia, and the UK. We are also having regional winners in all 50 states, all Canadian provinces, and every country worldwide. So probably a hundred winners getting $50,000 in prizes, some really nice prizes, um, and it ends tomorrow. So to vote, go to lqscontest.com and you'll see a link right on there to vote. And there's thousands of shops listed. Um, if you can't find your favorite shop, um, you can add them. But um, it's even stores who only get one vote appreciate so much that somebody voted for them and said what they love about them. And you know, it, it encourages them to do better the next year. So at right now we have almost 40,000 votes for over 1900 stores in 11 countries, but um, you've still got time to, to vote for your shop and winning shops will get a buy any trunk show where we send them models and free patterns. And so um, if you want to see our models up close and personal, it's a really nice way to ensure that will happen. Great. So I think I have it up here, right? At LQSContest.com. Is that That's it? it. Yep. Okay. So I got that scrolling. I got a couple questions on the soft and stable I want to get up here before we um, start to wrap up here. Um, uh, I think you've already answered this, um, but Laurel, I want to know what's the best way to keep the fabric from moving on the, on, you know, the cotton layer against the soft and stable. So one thing about our soft and stable is that it's got this kind of fuzzy fabric trico lining on it. And if you look at this, you can see I can take this piece and shake it and it pretty much stays where I put it. If you're quilting a great big piece, it is going to move 
as you go a little bit. You can put pins in to hold it. You can use spray basting to hold it. Um, we just released a new product um, that's a basting tape. And I've occasionally just done an X of that on there to hold it in place. But usually I put like maybe four pins in a piece and then I just smooth it as I go and keep it going. The reason I don't like the fusible is that the fusible glues your fabric in place. And as it wears, or even as you just turn your piece inside out, it separates. And for instance, if you look well, let me get one of these flat pieces. If you look at this, this is sewn only around the outside edges. So I can grab this piece of fabric and pull it up. It's not attached anywhere but on the edge. As I let go, can you see how it's almost like a magnet? It pulls it right back into place. Mm -hmm. And that static that it creates really helps hold it there. And it really doesn't move that much. And then you don't have that, I always call it cellulite. It looks like my thighs, yeah. you know, when it starts to separate and you get all that wrinkly, it looks like elephant skin. Well, and fusing, you know, we, that's another whole topic, but, you know, your iron, my iron, um, you know, June's iron, Anne's iron, everybody's iron is different. And fusibles, really, most of them require a very specific way of doing it or things are not maybe gonna you know come out good especially in the wash so right. yeah i i'm with you i you know there's a time and a place for fusibles but i really love the fact that your um soft and stable is is just almost like a like a self self stick and then um let's see somebody asked if it's washable i won't won't pull up the comment but definitely um, washable yeah, yeah. You okay. can take a piece of soft and stable, throw it in the washer and dryer. It comes out just like it went in. It's like on this bag, I had to quilt every few inches across the back because you can't go that far across without quilting your soft or your batting to your fabric. But on the soft and stable one, again, it's just sewn around the outside edges. It washes beautifully and dries. On my bigger bags, I don't like to listen to the hardware banging around in the dryer. So I usually let them air dry, but placemats makes fabulous placemats. Yeah, and those I, I throw in the washer and dryer every time I use them. Absolutely. Well, you know, the other thing that the whole thing, I mean, again, we could talk about soft and stable probably for an hour in and of itself, but what one of the things that I love about it, and I, because I've used that and I've also used, you know, fusible batting. And I use that in some projects, but when you have something that's hard to turn right side out, um, a lot of times you get exactly what you just talked about, that crinkly, crunkly look um, from some other fusibles, whereas the soft and stable, it's not fused. It's got a whole different texture. And when you turn that item right side out, it just, it goes pop. It's almost like it's like made out of you know, something um, that's that's made to self-expand almost. Yeah, so. and, you know, if you get a piece of soft and stable that's been folded up in a package on a shelf for a while and you open it up and it's got all those folds and wrinkles in it, all you have to do is hit it with some steam and it does. It just pops right up like it just came off the roll. Yeah. And, and you're back, um, too. Mary's got uh, maybe a little bit of a out-of-the-box question for sure, but she's saying... Can the soft and stable be used on garment sewing? Um, I have used soft and stable like in the waistband on an apron because I wanted it. I had made a gathered one and I want it to kind of hide the gathers. But like for a vest or something, it's got a lot of body. And, you know, and depending if you quilt it, you might look like the Michelin man when yeah, you're done. It's, it's so made to stand out. I don't really recommend it for quilts either, just because you want your quilt to drape around you. But if you're making a wall hanging or a yeah. table runner that you want to have nice crisp shape, it's ideal for that. But but Mary's got my that, my mind thinking a little bit um, yeah. that uh, I, maybe on a yoke or a collar or a cuff or some yep. area where you do want it to to step you know pop out, and certainly in the whole area of costume making you know, there it opens up a, a whole new world. So that was a great, great, great question. Yep. Teresa says cosplay, um, yep. those kind of things. I'm sure they're, they're loving your product. When um, I taught my first craftsy class, maybe it wasn't the first one, but one of them, the guy who was the producer on it does a lot of cosplay. And 
he was so excited to get it. You know, he was doing yeah. helmets and boots and arm things and, you know, things that would stick out and hold their shape. Yeah. Lots well, of ways you can do it. It's hard to believe we've been going for almost 90 minutes here. So we will need to wrap up um, shortly. But Susan has a question. How do you press the fold marks out of the soft and stable before cutting and sewing? Just steam it. Okay. Just set Great. your iron on like a medium heat, good steam, and just go right along it. And those folds will completely disappear. Excellent. Excellent. And um, thank you, Barbara, for your comment. This has been a great show. Annie, I've got to have you back because uh, we definitely have have more to talk about. But um, I think we probably you're probably ready to wrap it up for tonight and say goodbye to everybody. So thank you so, so much for being on the show. And I can't wait to have you back again. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it and would love to come talk more. Thank you, Annie. I look forward to it and everyone else will too. So we'll say goodbye for you tonight and bye -bye. Um, wish you happy sewing and can't wait to have you back for sure. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, this has been wonderful. Thanks for hanging out for almost a full 90 minutes. And um, until we meet again, I want to wish you all a world full of pretty stitches. So we'll see you again soon.